Hello. So in a previous couple of videos, I attempted to use basic attention as well as a single transformer encoder layer to forecast some simple time series. And I was happy with the results of those experiments, but I wanted to shift topics slightly to something that's of extreme interest to me, which is protein language modeling. And in order to do this, I selected a problem that I felt a simpler architecture would work for so that I could keep using the transformer encoder layer as opposed to a full large language model. Uh, but in the future, I might want to extend this up to something like a Probert level model. Um, but in doing this, I also tried a couple things that didn't work. And so I wanted to highlight those as well because I feel like they're very good lessons learned. Uh, but then I also want to show an approach that did work for the very simple problem that I chose. And so to speak to this problem in a little more detail, I chose the PFAM dataset, uh, which can be found online and consists of independent variables, which are amino acid sequences, um, with the goal of predicting the dependent variable, which is a protein class. And so in order to pre-process the amino acid sequences, I use the Probert tokenization scheme, uh, where each amino acid is assigned an integer value. And there are three very important special tokens. Uh, the padding token, which is appended to the end of a sequence that is not full length, as well as the CLS token and the SEP token, which are appended to the beginning and end of a sequence, respectively. And so upon pre-processing this data, I also pre-processed the class labels, which were uh, string valued uh, so that they could be one hot vectors so that we can use a softmax output to do class prediction. And I'll speak to this a little bit more on the upcoming slides, but uh, this was the method that actually worked for me. Um, and on the next slide, I'll talk about how I originally approached this um, in a way that failed. My original idea was that a softmax wouldn't be appropriate for a very large multi-class problem. And I wanted to try to do something a little creative and encode the uh, labels uh, for the protein classes using an autoencoder um, and then using those encodings as my loss metric and then finally decoding upon inference. And I was excited that this worked very well for a very small 10 class version of this problem. Uh, but then I found as I scaled up, this actually had a massive training cost and did not converge often for larger class problems. And so I don't want to speak to this in too much detail uh, because it didn't work, but I wanted to highlight that uh, I had come up with a more complicated idea thinking that it would win out over a simple softmax output. And I found that using the simpler approach um, worked a lot better, which is, I think, a common lesson learned in machine learning problems. And so very briefly before getting into the model, I just wanted to highlight a few disclaimers. Uh, the hardware I'm using to perform training and inference is a 3080 RTX with 10 gigabytes of memory. And so uh, this comes with two major issues. The first is that sequence length uh, is a major memory issue. And so I had to reduce the problem to sequences of length 512 amino acids maximum. I didn't see this as a huge issue because this is the context window of a BERT model. However, if classifying proteins that are much larger than this, uh, there are hardware considerations to be made. And in addition to this, data size uh, became a major uh, time issue in terms of training time. And so the original problem was 30,000 classes, um, but I reduced this to the 100 classes with the most examples in order to save time on training. And so this is making the problem a little bit simpler, but it's still a very large multi-class problem, and I think it shows off this approach pretty well. Um, and as a final note, I also re uh, rebalanced the, the data within these classes so that we wouldn't run into an imbalanced data problem. And so to describe the model architecture before getting into the code, uh, there are two steps that are required before the main transformer component in the model. And this is the input embedding and the uh, positional encoding, uh, very similar to the time series problem from previous videos, with the exception of 
uh, the input embedding being a simple PyTorch embedding layer. Uh, the embedding layer requires integer inputs, so it wasn't viable for the time series problem. Uh, but since we've tokenized our amino acid sequence, sequences according to the Probert tokenization scheme, uh, we can now use this layer for our input embedding. And so the data coming into the input embedding layer is of dimensions, batch size, and sequence length. And this layer appends an additional dimension of the user-defined embedding size. Um, and then with the positional encoding, this is uh, still the PyTorch positional encoding class uh, copied into our code. And this is a dimension preserving operation uh, where the output of that layer is batch size, sequence length, embedding size, and dimension as well. Uh, now the data is ready to be passed to the transformer. Uh, the PyTorch transformer encoder layer class uh, is also a dimension preserving operation. And so the data coming out of uh, the transformer is also batch size, sequence length, and embedding size and dimension. Uh, I then applied a 1D convolutional layer just to reduce the dimensionality of the data. And I applied this over the sequence length uh, dimension because I was using it in both the um, autoencoder uh, approach that didn't work as well as uh, the approach that ended up working out. And so this helps reduce the dimensionality of the data to dimensions of batch size and bedding size, but it also provides an additional set of weights that can be learned uh, in the training process. The final steps are to uh, convert this into a classification problem. And so I've added linear layers uh, after the convolutional 1D layer. Uh, I added one that is also of embedding size. And then I added one that is just the number of classes that we want to output. And so upon um, passing the data through the linear layers, our dimensions are now batch size uh, number of classes. And uh, we need to activate uh, that data using softmax so that we can get our one hot um, comparison with our, with our actual data set. And so we apply a final softmax activation uh, to this output. And so uh, before showing the results of this experiment, I just want to briefly step through uh, the implementation using PyTorch. And so I've split this into two files, one file containing all of the model components, and then the second file being a script which calls this model and applies training and then uh, inference so that we can collect our results. And so I have the model file open here first, and after importing all of our necessary uh, PyTorch components, as well as uh, NumPy, I then copied in the positional encoding directly from PyTorch, which applies uh, positional encoding as it's implemented in the attention is all you need paper. And so having defined this class so that we can use this as a component in our model, I developed the model class which I called PFAM model. And so I define all of the hyperparameters in init with default values and then I assign some necessary values for the forward function to, uh, to the class level. Um, and upon doing this, I define all of our model components. So I take the uh, transformer encoder layer, which is a single, um, single transformer en encoder imported from PyTorch, initialized with uh, its own hyperparameters. And then I define our input embedding as a simple uh, PyTorch embedding layer, uh, where our dictionary of tokens is of size 30, which I'll show in the script class. And then I uh, create an instance of that positional encoding class for our positional encoder. And then I apply our regression components using uh, the PyTorch 1D convolutional layer and some linear layers with the final softmax activation. And so a forward pass of this model is relatively simple since all of the heavy lifting is handled by uh, the PyTorch classes. Um, but to just show off the forward pass very quickly, I am also copying in this, um, this masking function directly from PyTorch using their own implementation and I generate that at the beginning of the forward pass and then I apply all of our layers in sequence, uh, the first being the input embedding, uh, then our positional encoding, uh, then we pass that to the transformer component and then we apply our regression layers and finally uh, softmax activation. And so how this is called from uh, the script file 
Uh, there's a variety of data pre-processing that I included at the beginning of our script. Uh, after our imports, I defined a dictionary that uh, houses those uh, ProBERT tokens for tokenization of the amino acid sequences. Uh, then I defined a naive function to pad sequences that are not of length uh, 512 and to truncate sequences longer than uh, 512 tokens. Um, and finally, I defined a one-hot encoding function uh, to convert our labels to one-hot encodings of the labels for the soft max uh, uh, loss comparison. And so, after defining our pre-processing functions, I set all of my uh, hyperparameters in this block of the script, and these are uh, as a, as um, as set for my last 100 class run, and then um, I move directly into pre-processing the data, and so this in sequence uh, applies the dictionary of tokens for tokenization, uh, as well as the uh, pre-processing function for the input data uh, to get everything to the appropriate length uh, via padding or truncation, and. Um, this line in particular uh, defines how many classes we're going to be using for for the current uh, experiment. And so uh, for the last experiment, this truncates the data to the top 100 classes uh, by the number of samples. And so after the data is pre-processed, I then call the, or I define the model that was shown in the in the other file. And uh, from there, I apply the training loop after defining um, MSE loss, which is left over from the from the autoencoder approach, and ideally for a classification problem, this would be cross entropy. Uh, but I found that this works very well, so um, I've left it in for now. Um, after after finding that that the results were were still good with mean squared error loss, even though this is classification, um, I use Adam W um, just as as a common practice for my optimizer. And then I defined a, a, a learning rate scheduler, but I didn't end up using it in the, in the final experiments. And so after constructing the, uh, the training set and the test set, um, I move uh, directly into training, uh, where I loop over the epochs um, for, the, for the training data to, to perform the training. And then I, I switch to evaluation and loop over our test data so that I can collect validation loss at each training step. And I implemented some, some model checkpointing based on the best validation loss as well as early stopping. Uh, I didn't end up using the early stopping, but I, I do use the best checkpointed model uh, upon inference, which in the cases of this experiment were, were the last model run typically. Finally, I, I evaluate the model using only the test data, and I, I use this just to collect the predictions so that we can uh, perform our analysis. Uh, using accuracy and I output that to to a separate file uh, so that I can collect the data. And so I wanted to end the video with a brief discussion of the results. I originally started with even smaller problems of 30 classes and 50 classes just to test out this approach before moving to the full uh, 100 class experiment. And across the board the accuracies look very good, however this is still a very truncated version of the original problem which was 30,000 classes, many of the classes with very few examples. And so I think this problem is very interesting and I, I want to continue to focus on it and I think my next step is to see how far this can be pushed um, in terms of, of tackling the entire problem of 30,000 classes. And so I think I would like to try a hierarchical transformer model as my next step. Uh, but I also want to explore whether or not the transformer encoder is overkill uh, for the, for the uh, problems I've tackled already. And so I want to move into recurrent neural networks and some more traditional approaches and see how those work as well. And so I'm happy with the outcomes here and I want to continue to explore this problem. And so I'm hoping to continue that in future videos. But for now, I thank you for watching and um, I hope this was informative and, and, and helpful.